New Insight into IELTS Website Practice Test by Vanessa Jakeman and Claire McDowell Published by Cambridge University Press This recording is copyright. Practice Test You will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the real test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a travel agent and a company that organizes tours. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, Sydney Harbour Bridge Climb, Michael speaking. Oh, hi, it's Julia calling from Hotspots Travel in Seattle in the United States. Good afternoon. Or should I be saying good evening? Well, it's good morning, in fact. Oh, of course. You're a day ahead of us, aren't you? So, what's the time over there in Australia? Uh, 9.30 or 10? It's 9 in the morning. The time is 9 a.m., so the answer is A. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Hello, Sydney Harbour Bridge Climb, Michael speaking. Oh, hi, it's Julia calling from Hotspots Travel in Seattle in the United States. Good afternoon, or should I be saying good evening? Well, it's good morning, in fact. Oh, of course, you're a day ahead of us, aren't you? So, what's the time over there in Australia? Uh, 9.30 or 10? It's 9 in the morning. And how can I help you? Well, I've got some clients who would like to climb your Harbour Bridge when they come to Sydney. That is open to tourists, isn't it? Absolutely. It sounds like a fantastic thing to do, but I do have a couple of questions before I go ahead with any bookings. Sure. Uh, first question... Are there any restrictions on the number of people who can do the climb at the same time? I only ask because we've got a group of 18 people who want to do this together. Well, there's actually a limit of 12 people for every climb, so we'd have to split them up, I'm afraid. 12 in one group, and then the other six could join a later group. The tours go every 10 minutes, so they wouldn't be far behind. OK, that sounds fine. And what's the cost? I had a look on your website, but I just want to confirm the prices. Well, there are a couple of different rates depending on when you want to go. During the week, it's $169. Is that American dollars? No, Australian dollars, so that's a little less. And it costs $189 at the weekends. So, $169 weekdays... That's for an adult, and for a child, it's $100 during the week. Right. But do bear in mind that children under 10 are not permitted to climb. Uh-huh. Um, so how long does it take? The whole experience takes just over three hours, so you'll need to allow the whole morning. Wow. So will they be climbing for all that time? 
No, no. The climb itself is shorter than that. The first hour involves a comprehensive safety briefing and demonstration on the ground. Uh huh. And after the briefing, they'll spend approximately one hour getting to the top of the bridge, and then another hour to come back down. Right. I see. And if you don't mind my asking, is it safe? <laughs> Have you had anybody fall off? Well. Safety is our number one priority. Everyone wears a safety harness while they're doing the climb. It's quite secure. Oh, good. And the view must be fantastic from up there. Great for taking photos. Yes, the view is fantastic. But you're not actually permitted to carry cameras on you, I'm afraid. Oh, that's a shame. Why is that? Because there's a risk of dropping them down onto the cars below, and that could be very dangerous. Aha.、Uh -huh. So does that mean we don't have any photographic record of the climb? No, not at all. We have our own photographer who goes with you and takes lots of shots, and we then provide you with one free photo when you get back down. And they can buy more, of course, if they like. That's up to them. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. It must get pretty windy up there. So should they wear some windproof clothing? You know, an anorak or jacket of some sort. No need for that because all climbers are provided with our special suit to wear. Oh, really? Sounds more like a moonwalk with a safety harness and suit. <laughs> yeah, a number of people have said that. So climbers should make sure they bring something which isn't too heavy, such as a T-shirt. I see, because they need to be able to put the suit on over their own clothes. Exactly, and we do stipulate that climbers must wear rubber-soled shoes, such as trainers. So avoid open shoes with leather soles or sandals, as they might slip. Because you see, they'll have to climb up and down 465 steps and squeeze in and out of the girders. Boy, so you need to be pretty fit to do this climb. Yes, it's certainly not recommended for anyone with a medical condition, such as a heart problem. Well, I don't think we have anyone in that category in this group, but I'll let them know. Meanwhile, could we look at some possible dates? Certainly. Let me get some contact details from you first. Sure. Well, my name is Julia Kramer. That's K R A M E R, and I'm with Hot Spots Travel. We're based in Seattle. Do you have an email address that I can contact you on? Sure. It's info at hotspots dot com. That's I N F O at hotspots. H O T S P O T S dot com. The group will be in Sydney for the week commencing August twenty one for four days. We'd really like to do this on August twenty two or twenty three, if possible. Well, let's see.、Mm, we do have a vacancy for the twenty second. Oh, but hang on, that won't do because there are eighteen of you, aren't there? It'll have to be on the twenty third to accommodate that number. Great, I just need to run that date past my clients. Fine, or you can book online. You know, if that's easier for you. Yeah, that might be best. And thank you so much. You really. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear an extract from a talk about clocks. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 and 12. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 and 12. Good morning and welcome to the programme. And this week we're talking about famous objects and in particular clocks. And in the studio with us is Dylan Rees, a man with a passion for clocks. Thanks, Chris. Well, I've always been fascinated by clocks and in particular I like public clocks. For me, they represent everything that is good about a society. Civic pride, social stability and a sense of community. If you forget your watch one morning, or you can't afford a watch for that matter, you can always rely on there being a public clock somewhere nearby to help you out. By definition, such clocks are designed to be noticed. So they tend to be in prominent positions, such as church towers, railway stations or other tall buildings. Sometimes they function as advertisements too. And so far, nobody has found a way of charging you to use them. Unlike digital clocks, which just show the time as a set of boring electronic numbers, the hands on the face of a clock represent time itself by moving round. Others announce the time by making some kind of noise. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 13 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 13 to 20. For today's programme, I've selected four clocks from four different countries to share with you. I suppose the most famous clock has to be the clock tower at the northeast end of the Houses of Parliament in Westminster in London. Most people know it as Big Ben, but this is actually only a nickname for the main bell rather than the clock itself. The clock first went into service in September 1859. The main bell, which weighs 13.8 tonnes, is the biggest bell in England. It rings every hour on the hour. It also has four smaller bells, which ring on the quarter hour. You find it on things like postcards, biscuit tins, tourist brochures, and I think that's what I love about it, the fact that it's so very well known. My next clock is very different and certainly much smaller. You'll find it in the suburb of Gastown in Vancouver in Canada. It's unusual in that it's powered by steam and is known quite simply as the steam clock. The steam comes from a system of pipes running under the ground which also provide heating for many of the buildings in the square. It's based on an original design dating back to 1875, but the clock itself is relatively new, as it was only built and first used in 1977. Although it doesn't look like Big Ben, it does play the famous Westminster chimes every hour and every quarter hour a loud whistle sounds, so you won't have to wait long to hear it. At night time, you can see steam rising from the top of the clock, and it's certainly more impressive at night than during the day, but I always find it charming. One of my real favourites is the magnificent clock in the cathedral in Strasbourg in France. The actual clock mechanism was constructed in 1842 by Swiss watchmakers, but there were other craftsmen involved in its construction. Not only does it show the time, it also shows time passing. Every day at 12.30, the clock puts on a special show depicting the story of our human journey. It does this with four different characters. First, you see the figure of a child move onto the stage, followed by a teenager. Then the adult makes his appearance, and finally an old man. For me, it's not just a clock, it's a work of art. My last clock is in Tehran in Iran, very different from the others we've looked at, because it's not in a tower or on a building. It's called the flower clock, 
and it sits in a prominent position on a hill in a park visible from the highway. It was built in 2005 and is the largest of its type in the world. It measures 15 metres across and weighs 750 kilograms. Being in such an exposed position in the open air, it has to withstand all weather conditions, rain, snow and wind. The mechanisms controlled by a computer, with a separate motor for each hand, guaranteed to operate with minimum error. I like it because it's such an unusual design. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing preparations for a fieldwork project. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. So, today we're going to prepare the ground for the fieldwork project that you need to do for your midterm assessment. Last week, I said that we'd start by looking at some of the positive and negative sides of fieldwork, and I asked David and Maria to begin the session by doing this. Um, yes. We've decided to present these in the form of a table and to do it by briefly comparing the strengths and weaknesses of fieldwork as against research in the laboratory. That's a good idea. Yes. Um, so, first of all, the difference between the two methods. Research in the field, and by that we mean research in what's termed a real-life situation, is, well, a lot of family research, for example, is field-based, because you need to have your subjects behaving as they would normally. I guess when we think of lab research, we often think of medical research or psychological tests. Yes, the lab's good for this because you need to make sure that you know exactly what people are doing. So this is a major strength of lab work, which we've highlighted. The lab provides a controlled environment. Yeah, you can really make sure that the variable that you want to study is isolated you can keep all the others under control. The other big strength of the lab is that you might need things. Um, for example, a running machine if you're doing an experiment on fitness. Or medical machinery. There's no limit, really, to the amount of technical equipment that you can have in a lab. So that's another strength. But there are a few negatives to lab experiments, and the main ones for us were what we've called the ecological validity. This refers to the false nature of lab experiments. Mm. And another problem is that in the field you can pick and choose your subjects, but you have to ask people if they'll participate in the lab. Which means that you only get subjects who are willing to take part. And the big question then is, will this have an impact on the research findings? So that's the second main weakness of lab research. With field research, the main advantage is that the ecological validity is improved because the surroundings aren't specially designed in any way. But there are certain drawbacks, and they're quite big ones. Yeah, it's much harder to keep some effects that you don't want out of the experiment. If you want to examine the effects of noise on sleep, say, this would be tricky because you never know what noises are going to occur outside a lab. In the lab, you can control the noise. Right. And finally, big, big disadvantage, though a lot of wildlife researchers do amazingly well with this. It can be really hard when it comes to setting up the whole experimental area. There's all the issues like how long you leave things like cameras, recorders, that kind of thing there, once they've been set up, how it's looked after and so on. 
Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Thanks. That's a very clear overview. So, we're going to do some fieldwork research that doesn't require very much equipment, but it does, like much research of this kind, involve the production of a questionnaire. There is a new housing estate here, and we're going to find out how people feel about living there. Oh, that sounds interesting. Now, before we start talking about questionnaire design, let's consider all the practical things that have to be done when you administer a questionnaire. Are we going on to the street to interview people? I'm not very keen on that. Why? Well, people can be quite hostile, can't they? Well, you'll be relieved to hear, Dave, that we're going to visit people in their homes. Oh. So, what do you need to consider first? Um, things like deciding which residents to interview. Exactly. And you can't just do it in a random way, you know, go out and deliver it and think you'll remember who had one. <laughs> and presumably you can't cover all the occupants, that would be too many. So, do you have to write down which households have been given a questionnaire? Yes. And the best thing is to set up a database to do this. And the collection. I guess you need to think about how long to leave it with them. Oh, but aren't we going to do it with them at the door? Well, your input might influence them then. It's better if they complete them on their own. Oh, I see. So, when you design the questionnaire, you need to have an idea about the sort of information you want and how long you want to give them to respond. Like how well they get on with their neighbours. They wouldn't know that straight away, would they? No. So, you have to give them long enough to find out. OK, now let's go on to the questionnaire design, I think. Now, this is a really important thing. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about traffic management. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. I'd like you to give a warm welcome to our guest speaker today, Dr. Carl Wingfield from the Faculty of Engineering. Dr. Wingfield is an expert in road systems and he's going to talk to us about the use of technology in traffic management and the effects that this technology is having on our lives. Thank you very much, Irene. <clears throat> well, let me start by asking, hands up everyone who came here today by a car. Hmm, looks like about half of you. And hands up those of you who went through a set of traffic lights on your way here, or passed a speed camera, or used a toll road. Hmm, most of you in fact. So whether you like it or not, You've left an electronic data trail behind you. 
And this means that first, the traffic authorities can track where your car has been today, and second, at what time you made the journey. The question is, is this a good or a bad thing? Well, the transport authorities think it's a good thing. They say that their tracking systems, and by that I mean speed cameras, red light cameras, e-tags for tolls and bridges, are for our own good. They argue that there's an urgent need to reduce the number of traffic accidents on our roads, and the technology is being used to encourage safe driving. They also say, and I think everyone who's ever been stuck in traffic before would have to agree on this one, that they need to manage the increasing volumes of traffic more efficiently by keeping the traffic flowing smoothly to minimise traffic jams. And there are some other advantages which have less to do with traffic and more to do with law and order. The road traffic authorities, and in particular the police, are keen to tackle the increasing problem of car theft by making it harder for thieves to steal cars in the first place and easier to find the cars after they've been stolen. So, let's have a look at what's happening in a number of other countries. In the UK, a company has come up with the idea of e-plates. These are electronic number plates that have a radio frequency identification tag that's an RFID, embedded in them, which acts as a tracking device. These RFID tags transmit a unique code that can't be seen or removed from the car, but which allows the car to be tracked from a considerable distance. The manufacturers say that a single reader at the roadside can identify dozens of vehicles fitted with an E-plate and they can do this from as far away as 100 metres or approximately 300 feet. One potential problem, however, is that they might not last as long as the cars themselves, because the e-plates have a battery life of 10 years. So, how do countries feel about e-plates? The e-plates project has been under development in the UK for the past three years at a cost of more than £1 million and is currently being trialled there. The British government is extremely interested in the idea of e-plates to replace standard registration plates and other governments are taking note too. Officials in the United States say they'll be watching the British trials closely as they contemplate the introduction of the plates to make vehicles electronically trackable for all the reasons we've mentioned already. However, at this stage, they say they will wait to see what the outcome of the UK trial is before they make a decision. In Malaysia, the government is going ahead with e-plate trials and they plan to implement the system in two stages, starting with new cars, followed by those already on the road. They see this technology as being state-of-the-art and are convinced that it will bring many advantages. Here in Australia, we're biding our time on the question of e-plates. Although we've embraced the electronic toll systems with great enthusiasm, and most cars are now fitted with an e-tag on the windscreen. I know there have been high-level discussions, but so far... The Australian traffic authorities say they do not intend to trial e-plates. We do anticipate, however, that by the year 2012, all new vehicles will be equipped with GPS satellite navigation systems as a standard fitting. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. At the end of the real test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.